welcome to Calcutta, my home away from home. Today I'm going to show you an Imambara which is also a symbol of India's first war of independence. I'm talking about the Septenabad Imambara in the Machia Bruj area. This Imambara has a typical feel of Lucknow. So what is it doing here in Calcutta? Therein lies the history. This Imambara was built by the famous Nawab Wajid Ali Shah and it also happens to be his mausoleum. There is another important personality buried under this very roof, a freedom fighter. I will talk about him shortly. The kingdom of Wajid Ali Shah, Awadh or the present day Lucknow to be precise, initially protected by the British under treaty was eventually annexed on February the 11th, 1856. He was exiled to Garden Reach in Matya Burj, then a suburb of Calcutta, where he lived for the remaining days of his life. He began building this Imambara in 1860 and it was completed in 1864. It was opened to general public for the commemoration of Muharram. I was honored to have Janab Kamran Mirza, the great great grandson of Wajid Ali Shah himself, to show me around this beautiful place. Here, a painting of Imam Ali killing Marhab in the famous battle of Fort Khaibar. A rising pulpit or member for Majalis and Discourse, along with the royal symbol in silver. A beautiful tazia in memory of Imam Hussain. Antique alums or standards in memory of Hazrat Abbas, the younger brother and commander of Imam Hussain's army in Karbala. Grand arches and colorful chandeliers, typical of the Imambaras of Lucknow. The black tiles on the floor mark the graves of the members of the extended royal family. And of course, the fish emblems, the symbol of all Imambaras of Awadh. Sadly, Wajid Ali Shah could never return to Lucknow, so he brought a part of Lucknow to himself. It is true what they say, you can drive a man out of his homeland, but you cannot drive the homeland out of a man. The freedom fighter buried inside the Simambara is Birjis Tadr, the son of Wajid Ali Shah and the last king of Awadh. After Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was exiled to Calcutta, his wife, the valiant and indomitable Begum Hazrat Mahal, revolted against the British East India Company and seized control of Lucknow. She put her son Birjis Tadr in place of ruler and he became in charge of the uprising of Lucknow. Unfortunately, their reign was short-lived and after the suppression of the Great Revolt of 1857 and following the bloody siege of Lucknow, both mother and son found asylum in Nepal, where she died in 1879, hoping to someday return to her homeland. On 15th August 1962, the government of India honored Begum Hazrat Mahal for her role in India's first war of independence. On 10th May 1984, it issued a commemorative stamp in her honor. Birji Skadr returned to India 18 years later. He was poisoned and he rests at the other end of the hall under this makeshift platform that currently holds the royal symbol. With his death, India lost the last man who ever donned the crown and graced the throne. Birji Skadr and his mother Begum Hazrat Mahal are among the first freedom fighters of India. They along with many others shook the very foundation of the British Empire. They sowed the seeds of the tree of freedom, a tree that would bear fruit 90 years later. They are the forgotten revolutionaries. Isn't it symbolic for an Imam Bara to house the grave of an Indian freedom fighter? And why not? Imam Hussain sacrificed his life fighting against injustice in the face of the tyrannical Yazid. Indeed, India's freedom struggle is inspired by Imam Hussain in more ways than one. And so, with much reflection, Mahatma Gandhi famously said, I learned from Imam Hussain how to achieve victory while being oppressed. Conclusively, to quote my favorite English poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Lives of great men all remind us, we can make our lives sublime, and departing, leave behind us, footprints on the sands of time. Jai Hind!